My family has a tradition at Christmas. Um, whenever we do our big Bogue family gathering for Christmas, we will eat a huge meal and we'll spend time together getting caught up with relatives and, and all that good stuff. And then we'll open up our presents. Uh, but every year before we open presents, we always take time to read the Christmas story out of the scripture. Uh, we've done this every year that I can remember. Um, it started with my grandfather being the one to read the scriptures. Occasionally, every now and again, it might be one of my parents or an aunt or an uncle or something like that. Uh, but as the years went on and as, as we grew as the kids and learned how to read for ourselves, it kind of became almost a competition as to which one of us, my brother, uh, my cousins, or myself, would be the ones to read the Christmas story for that year. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been really cool because we have been able to uh, have our children uh, be the ones who've carried on this tradition, and, and they are the ones who get to read the Christmas story before we open up presents, um, even though mom and dad still have to help a little bit with the big words. Uh, your family may have a similar tradition of your own, or maybe you do something that nobody else does. But every year about this time, we are reminded of the story of the birth of Jesus. And while I do believe that it is important for us to remind ourselves of that story, there's something that tends to happen with this kind of repetition. And that's that we become, well, used to it. We, we kind of get used to this hearing the same story over and over again and and whenever we have that with any of the stories that we have that we are repeated throughout our lives, it kind of begins to lose its meaning to us. Uh, we become comfortable with it. And, and when we talk about it when it comes to Scripture, it, it kind of makes it difficult for us to remember that these people in Scripture were real people going through real events and dealing with real emotions. Uh, none of them in Scripture knew how the story was going to play out or, or how God was going to use them in the way that he ends up ultimately doing so. And while we may know how the story turns out, and some of us by heart, these people had no idea what was going on. They didn't know how this was all going to be. Uh, we don't tend to think about that, though, because we get so comfortable with this story. And, and I think, honestly, that Christmas is probably one of the biggest times where this is highlighted because we are so familiar with the story of the birth of Jesus that oftentimes we just kind of forget that these were real people. And maybe it's because we just don't often try to look at things from their perspective. And so this Christmas season, we're going to spend some time trying to do just that thing. Today, we're going to start off uh, with a person who's part of the Christmas story who, in my opinion, we tend to overlook entirely. Uh, at least we think the least about him. Uh, we, we hear the stories about Mary and the angel, or we hear the stories about the shepherds and, and all the things that they went to, or the journey to Bethlehem, or the wise men, or all these other elements in the Christmas story, but we don't often talk about one particular person. One person who's mentioned as being there for the whole thing, and yet we don't really spend a whole lot of time talking about him. He makes the nativity scene, He's been in every single one that you've ever seen, but when it comes to the gospel narrative about the birth of Jesus, he's just kind of there. He doesn't get even as much of the story as the shepherds do. So today, I want to kind of put flesh and bone to somebody who I think doesn't get enough attention in Scripture, and that's Joseph. Joseph, by all accounts, was really just not that impressive of a guy. He was an ordinary man. He was kind of known in his society and in his culture and, and, and amongst his people in his town as a good guy, but he just wasn't really anything all that special. He was a carpenter by trade, which meant that he had pretty well steady work most of the time because everybody's got use for a carpenter. The people who knew Joseph knew him to be an honest businessman who wasn't going to try to cheat anybody out of anything, but at heart, Joseph was just a simple guy. There really wasn't that much special about him. And in fact, the only thing that really kind of made Joseph stand out in any way, shape, or form was that he comes from the line of King David. But honestly, I mean, David had so many wives and so many children that a lot of Israel could lay claim to being from the line of David. Uh, so even the thing that made him special really wasn't that special. 
But Joseph was a very devoted follower of God. He, he was somebody who held on to all the special days. He, he did his best not to work on the Sabbath in any way, shape, or form. He was careful to follow the law of God while still enjoying relationship with God. Um, and God continually looked at Joseph with favor, as he had done with some of Joseph's more famous forefathers. And then one day, his entire life changes. Joseph met the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen before. When he heard her name, it was embedded into his soul forever. Mary. Joseph was more taken with her than he even thought possible. As they kind of got to know each other and would occasionally chat with each other, Joseph hung on her every word like it was water for a very thirsty man. Joseph knew that he was ready to spend his entire life with her. He decided that he was going to ask for her hand in marriage. Now, in Jewish customs, uh, getting married wasn't as simple, really, as it is in our culture and our society. Um, It wasn't as simple as setting a date and getting a minister. And in fact, it was a very long, drawn-out process. The man would have to approach the father of the girl that he wanted to marry, and he'd have to ask for his father or her father's blessing. Um, I had to do this. I didn't have to do this. I did this with Mandy. I, I went to her father and asked for his permission to marry his daughter. Um, probably the most intimidating conversation I've ever had in my entire life. Um, but if the father agreed, then oftentimes the man would be required to give what was called a dowry, uh, which might be a payment of land or livestock or even, yes, money. Uh, for the privilege of being able to marry that young woman. Um, I'm actually planning on instituting the same thing for my eventual Um, (laughs) son-in-laws. But then the the man would have to approach the girl that he loved, and he would ask her for her hand in marriage. And if she agreed, then they were legally bound to each other. They were married, but they weren't quite all the way married. Um, Then the man would go, and he would go back home to his father's house, and he would build an extension on it. Uh, And that would be the home for the man and his new bride, a place for them to raise their family amongst his own family. When construction would eventually be over, months later, sometimes even years later, he would return to pick up his bride. The two would be wed in a lavish party and a lavish celebration. Some cases it would last for several days, depending on the wealth of the family. The lower class folks, the party might last a few hours if you had wealth and if you had privilege Sometimes the parties could last for weeks. Joseph approached Mary and asked for her hand after speaking with her father, and and she agreed to be his wife. And so Joseph went back home, and he worked hard. He toiled away on building a home for Mary and himself. He, He wanted to make sure that this house would be the home for her. And and you can imagine that as he's putting together rooms, he's thinking this is going to be where the children are going to play and this is going to be the hallway where we're going to hear their little feet running around as Mary and I just enjoy our love together as a family. As a carpenter, Joseph probably tried to make sure that this was the most perfect thing he'd ever built, making sure that every beam was square and all the, all the things were plumb and everything was just perfect and laid out exactly to order. Joseph was going to do everything he could to make sure that this home could be featured on HGTV one day. He was so excited about this whole idea, and this was a labor of love. He worked on that house day and night with only the thought of Mary and their lives together to keep him going. Months and months of work just continued. But after a while, Joseph was given the worst news that he could have ever received. He found out Mary, his beloved girl, the one that he was spending all of this time building this house for, the one that he had fallen head over heels in love with. He found out she'd become pregnant. And Joseph knew beyond a shadow of a doubt it was not his baby. Try and imagine what Joseph must have felt in that moment finding out that the woman that he loves, 
the woman that he was devoting his entire life to, the one that he was toiling night and day on this house for, had become pregnant with another man's child. You can imagine he was hurt. He felt betrayed. He never really thought that Mary was that kind of girl. He felt that he never really knew who she was at all. He felt lied to by the woman he loved more than life itself. And now all this work that he had done, all the months that he had spent building a home for them, it was all pointless. How could she do that to him? How could she cheat on him that way? This close to the wedding. But Joseph was ever still a good man. He decided that, uh, that she'd have to endure enough shame by having a child outside of wedlock, so he, he didn't want to add to it. At the core of him, he still cared for Mary, no matter what had happened between them. And so he didn't want to add to the scandal of an unwed pregnant mother by throwing on a divorce on top of it. So he did everything that he could to try to end the marriage privately, to save her from further embarrassment. Joseph quietly pursued a divorce. Scripture puts it in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, that her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. He didn't have to do this quietly. He didn't have to be this good a guy. He could have raised a big stink about it. He could have raised a huge fuss about it in the public square and, and drawn all kinds of attention to his hurt and his pain. But he knew that ultimately it wouldn't have accomplished anything. He had more respect for Mary than that. So he would do all of this as quietly as he could. But little did Joseph know that this baby would change the course of his life, let alone change the course of millions of lives after him. One night, when all of this is still going on and the pain is still raw and the wound is still fresh, Joseph is sleeping. And you have to imagine at a time like this in, in his life, it's a very restless sleep. And while he's sleeping, he has this incredibly wild dream take place. It's so vivid and so perfect that it, it almost feels real. In the midst of this dream, this, this man approaches Joseph, and he's not just a normal guy. He is dressed all in white. And we're not talking like just a white garb. We're talking like a white garb. It's abundantly clear in that moment that this is an angel. And the angel says to Joseph what we see in the last part of Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. It says, Joseph, son of David... Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. You can kind of picture that the angel's just looking at Joseph, just saying, hey man, I know this is weird and I know that you feel really hurt right now, but don't be afraid to keep pursuing Mary as your wife because all of this has been ordained by God. The child that she's carrying, as, as weird as this might sound, this is God's child. And you're going to name him Jesus. And when Joseph wakes up from that dream, you, you have to think at least there's at least one moment where he thinks to himself, maybe, I'm not going to eat matzo ball soup before bed anymore. <laughs> Joseph just kind of wondered if what the angel had to tell him was true and if if everything that he had said in this dream was for real and if this was exactly what God had planned for Joseph and Mary in their lives together. And so he quietly goes to speak to Mary and when she tells him the story of an angel coming to her and telling her that she was going to be the mother of the son 
of God, it all just kind of clicks. It all fits together almost too perfectly. And Joseph knows deep in his heart, this is really happening. And so he believes her. And the two of them continue on with their wedding preparations. Now, understand, Joseph is taking on an awful lot here. If Joseph would have continued on with the divorce, then everyone would have believed, kind of rightly, that Joseph must not be the father of the baby. His reputation would stay intact, and people may actually, out of sympathy for Joseph, give him more business and, and, and actually do more for him. He might be even more beloved at the end of this thing in his community because of what Mary's done to him. But by choosing to continue to prepare for the wedding and not abandoning Mary in this moment, people are going to start talking. And most of these people are going to assume that Mary and Joseph, well, they just couldn't wait for the wedding night. And in this particular time, that's just something you don't do. He might face tremendous amounts of rejection within his community. At the very least, people are going to lose the respect for Joseph that they once had for him. This is going to make his life way more difficult. It's not as simple as Joseph being a good guy here, that he's willingly taking Mary on as his wife in spite of the circumstances. This is him being willing to take a beating within the community for the sake of Mary and their unborn baby. And around this time, Caesar Augustus decides it's time to take a census of all the people. And this year we had to take a census as well, and, but for us it was as simple as maybe going online and taking five minutes to fill it out, or, or maybe you got the mail-in thing and you, you took a few minutes to fill that out and you sent it on back. For this particular time period, Caesar Augustus, for whatever reason, decided to make things a little more difficult for everybody. Part of the deal of this census was that you had to return to the town that your family is from, and you have to be accounted for there. And since Joseph and his family come from the line of David, that meant that they had to return to the city of David, the city of Bethlehem. And at the time, Joseph and Mary are living in the small town of Nazareth. Nazareth to Bethlehem is a three-day walk. He had to take Mary along with him. Because even though they haven't had the big ceremony yet, legally speaking, they are still married. Now, Mary is in her final trimester. She is about to pop any day now when this whole trip has to take place. I don't know if you've ever been traveling with a woman who is that pregnant, but uh, this is not exactly going to be the most fun road trip of their lives together. Um, it means that poor Joseph has to walk the entire three-day journey because if they have a donkey available, Mary has to ride it the whole time. They take the trip all the way to Bethlehem and, and even worse news happens for them. When they get to Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph, they, they weren't walking into a situation where family members were just going to throw open their doors to them no matter how pregnant that she was. In fact, Mary being pregnant outside of wedlock was the sort of thing that would get them ostracized from the family. And so whatever family Joseph had in Bethlehem, they're not allowing Mary and Joseph into their house. And so when we read the tail end of Luke chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, because there was no guest room available for them, it means that Mary and Joseph have likely tried every single relative that they could think of Second, third, fourth, fifth cousins on down the line. Twice removed, four times removed. Trying to find anyone who will let them just find a place to stay while they perform their civic duty. But nobody's willing to let them into their house. And because a census is taking place, and again, David had a lot of children who had a lot of children who had a lot of children. 
Every motel, every inn, every place they could possibly stay is booked up. And it's when they're finally just ready to give up and sleep in the streets that some stranger offers them a chance to sleep in his barn. And we say the word barn, but the reality was it was likely more like a cave that had been outfitted to be able to house animals within it. So Joseph is going to be stuck in a cave full of smelly farm animals with an incredibly pregnant wife. Awesome. Joseph is is sitting in the cave, kind of wondering how his life came to this point, how things got to here. He's in the middle of this dirty and smelly place where all kinds of animals are. He's He's uncomfortable because there's just no good place for him to lay back and just relax a little bit. And whatever sleep he's getting is is light at very best. And he's hoping that they can just wrap all this up in the next couple of days and get back home before the baby is born. He's sitting there in the midst of this situation, having come from a hometown that has begun to reject him and begin to reject his soon-to-be wife. Because they believe something that is a lie. And he's been ostracized from his community. He's maybe even been kicked out of his own family's household. And now to, be, to be, have to walk three days journey with a pregnant wife without even the luxury of being able to sit on an animal for part of the journey. Only to have to spend his time in this cave that stinks to high heaven. How could things possibly get worse? And it's in this moment, because of course it's in this moment, it happens. Mary turns to Joseph with a little bit of panic in her eyes. And she tells him, Joseph, it's time. And and to be honest with you here, I've always felt that that Luke chapter 2 verse 6 is just way too calm in their description of this whole situation. It says that, that while they were there, the time came for the baby to, to be born. But any guy who's ever been present when a woman is giving birth, especially when it's their wife, they know exactly what's happening in this particular moment. Joseph has just hit panic mode. He races all throughout town looking for someone, anyone who's willing to help. He's, he's knocking on every single door that he can, just saying, my, my wife, she's going into labor, and, and he's demanding that somebody boil sheets because for some reason you have to boil sheets whenever you're giving birth to a baby, and, and he's doing everything that he can, and he's panicking because there's this moment when, when the woman that you love is, is about to give birth, and it's just this immediate moment, and every guy who's ever had a child or, or has been around for this particular moment, they know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a moment where literally every Everything floods into your mind. Everything that could possibly go wrong, everything that you need to do that you haven't done yet, it just all hits you in that particular moment and you don't know what to do with your hands. You feel so incredibly helpless because there is absolutely nothing that you can do. You want to do everything you can to help out, but you have absolutely no idea what that is. Mary enters into full-on labor. She's pushing and she's screaming in pain. And and Joseph is just just as worried and just as weirded out by all of this as she is. He's holding her hand, trying to comfort her in any way that he can, and she is just destroying the thing. Yes, he's a carpenter. He's got very strong hands, but this woman who's in the midst of giving birth is breaking every bone in it. And when it seems like this is never going to let out and that everything is just absolute chaos, suddenly it gets very still and very quiet. And in a moment, this strange silence is broken. By the most amazing sound in the world. The sound of a baby crying as it enters the world for the first time. The midwife holds the child in her arms and tells them it's a boy. 
And Joseph looks over at his bride. And we see what he says, at, or we see what it says at the end of Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, where it says, And he, Joseph, named him Jesus. Mary looks at Joseph with the baby in her arms. And it all clicks. Right in this second, Joseph understands the responsibility that he has now. God has charged Joseph to raise the Son of God. It's Joseph's duty to make sure that this child is protected, that it's cared for, that it's clothed, that it's kept away from danger. I mean, it's, it's scary enough to understand that you have to raise your own child, but this is the son of God. Joseph really cannot mess this up. But as Mary holds the baby Jesus, Joseph knows beyond a shadow of a doubt, for the first time in his life, everything is crystal clear. He knows that his entire life has led to this. He accepts this responsibility not because of the pride that might come with it, but rather because he loves this child. This child that's going to go on to change the world has in this moment changed the heart of Joseph. There were likely a hundred times along the way that Joseph had probably second-guessed his decision to stay with Mary. Moments where he wondered if maybe he had just gone crazy. He had to give up a lot, a lot, in order to fulfill the purpose that God had given him. And it had to be scary. But sometimes, that's just what God does. He invites us to be a part of his grand plan for the world without telling us the whole picture. He doesn't tell us what it's all going to be like or, or how it's all going to go down or, or what it's all going to look like when it's over or how we're going to know it worked. He doesn't give us any of that stuff. And no matter how old you are or how long you've been following God, when you hear that call, when you feel that tug on your heart, when you know that God has called you to do something, it's scary. It can be nerve-wracking. It can be intimidating. And even though it was all those things for Joseph, even though Joseph endured this and more that we don't know about or that we can't even guess at, even though Joseph had so many moments where he was just in an absolute panic and wanted to walk away, I want to remind you of something that I think is very deep and very profound. I want to remind you that Joseph did it anyway. He didn't know the whole scope of what God had called him to do in the moment. He didn't know how everything in his life was going to change the minute he decided to stop pursuing the divorce. He didn't know how much of his life was going to be different in the months, in the weeks, in the years to come. But he did it anyway. And Frankly, for so many of us, that's oftentimes where we fall short. We recognize the things that God wants us to do. We, we recognize the way that God has called us to do things in our, in our lives. We know that he is pulling us to do things that are outside of our comfort zone. And because it's so big and so scary and even so daunting, we don't do it. We tell God, no. Joseph could have said at any point in time in all of this, this is too much for me. 
And he could have walked away from all of it. And I doubt that God would have tried to stop him. But Joseph trusted that God had called him to do this thing. And even though it was scary, even though it was nerve-wracking, and even though it was outside of his comfort zone to say the least, Joseph followed through with God's call. And I'm willing to bet that if we could ask Joseph right now, if we could invite him to come and stand right here next to me, and if we asked him in that moment, do you regret it? I am certain that he would say it as loudly and as clearly as possible, not for a second. Joseph would have probably gone on to tell us this was the greatest thing he could have done with his entire life. Sometimes the call of God in our lives is scary. Sometimes it's going to cost us. Most assuredly, it's going to take us out of our comfort zones. But I believe that if you and I are willing to take that step of faith to head in the direction that God is leading us to head into, man, it's going to have such an amazing story to it. Maybe even a story that's told long after we're off this planet. We just have to be willing to step out into the unknown, trusting that God is going to guide us. So what are we waiting for? What are we letting hold us back? Let's step out in boldness and head in the direction that God points us to. I got a feeling we're not going to regret it.